Call me Ishmael. I hope you remember me. I am the one who survived the tragedy of the pig run. After two days, well, I was floating on for two days on what was supposed to be my friend's coffin. His name was Quick Quick, and he died on the tragedy when Moby Dick, the white whale, sank the ship. After two days, I sailed drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the Davis cruise in Rachel, when her retracing search after her, her missing children only found another orphan. I had nothing. I lost everything. I felt so bad because everything was taken away from me leaving me as I have been always, alone. So, I heard about the fount of magic and wisdom, and I went around the world looking for it, and finally I found it in the most hidden place of this planet. It is so secret that I cannot tell you where it is. But anyway, I drank from it, and a power was given to me, the power of traveling on time. I'm going to use it right now, and I want you to be my crew. I want you to join me in this adventure. Let's go to lands and cultures that you only hear about in books, movies, and documentaries. Let's meet people that you never imagine existing. Let's take courage and stay awake. Because this adventure is only for men thirsty for transcendence. So what's going to happen? I'm going to hit the floor three times with my cane. And we will appear in places where probably Moby Dick is at. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Have you seen Moby Dick? I don't know what you're talking about, but we are going to tell you about the Cinderella story. Please, Borgamas, tell him. Yeah, Cinderella story is an amazing story. What you might not know, my friend, is that the very beginnings of the story go beyond our Western culture and time. Its first version, known as Rhodopis, written by the Greek geographer Strabo, tells the story of a Greek slave, Rhodopis, who marries the king of Egypt. Wow. Yeah, but that's not everything, Brother Daniel. The story is the result of many versions that existed in many countries throughout the world. And just to give you an idea, my friend, the most important elements of Cinderella, such as the fairy godmother, the carriage, and the glass slipper can be found in the versions of countries like Persia, France, Malta, China, Vietnam, South Korea, Really? That's amazing, Borgamas. Yeah. Well, I must tell you that the story became very popular. Wait, 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 wait. I know that one, Borgamas. Are you going to talk about the Brothers Grimm? Exactly. Oh, yeah. The version of Cinderella published by the German brothers, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, in the 19th century made of Cinderella one of the most popular fairy tales of all times. Although, in the beginning, the story wasn't written for kids, later on, Disney will adapt it for children. <laughs> And that's why we relate the Cinderella story within this specific context. Isn't that amazing, Brother Daniel? It's amazing, Brother Gamas. What do you think, Ishmael? Well, you didn't talk about whales at all. But thank you anyway. I guess I found nothing here. 
Do you know where can I go? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, you can try Iceland. I think the Vikings can help you with that. Iceland? Yes. Yeah. Vikings? That's Later. a good place. See you. Okay. Let's go. Hello. Hello I'm a there. Viking. A what? A Viking. Okay. Well, technically I am a North Germanic person. But anyway, nice to meet you. How can I help you? Well, I am looking for Moby Dick. Um, Moby Dick? Um, it's an exceptionally large sperm whale with a wrinkled brow, crooked jaw, and a specially bushy spout. Well, I, I haven't heard about any Moby Dick, but I can tell you about the Younger Era. Since I am a Viking, I was just re reading a copy of it. The Younger Era is a book written in the 13th century that gathers the Nordic myths, or in other words, the stories that my ancestors believe and that have been passed down to me. I was just reading the chapter on the creation of the world and all the races. This is the part of the Vala's prophecy. The Vala's prophecy is a poem that contains the Nordic explanation of the creation of the world. It goes something like this. Before the creation of the world, there was nothing but a huge yawning void. And once that void called the Ginungapap was filled with both fire and water. The water became ice, and the ice was at the north, and the fire was at the south. After a while, the fire became drops, and those drops took the likeness of a man, and then Ymir was formed, the first giant from which we all came. From his descendants, they appeared both gods and frost giants. Then Ymir was killed, and some gods decided to put his body into the Ginunga Gap. And with his body, earth was made. Then it came about the distinction between heaven and earth. And then, after earth was made, the gods saw two trees over there, and they decided to make men out of them, to inhabit the world. And this, my brothers, was the origin of our race. Now, this is what we can learn about Nordic mythology. According to my mythology, before this age, our age, there was a magical age full of all kinds of creatures, gods and frost giants. There was also a constant battle between good and evil. The good was reflected on the gods and the evil on the frost giants. Odin was the greatest of the gods and he decided to make the city of Asgard for the gods to live and to protect themselves from the frost giants. Many of the good elements of my culture are reflected on the gods, such as the wisdom of Odin or the boldness of Thor. But our gods were not perfect, and this is how we, imperfect men, could relate to them and learn lessons. I could be for hours talking about the age of the gods, but you must know that this age ended with the famous battle of Ragnarok in which Odin considered necessary to die along with many other gods if the evil powers would die with them. This was a huge lesson of sacrifice for my people. Interesting. But you haven't answered my question. Where can I find a whale? Uh, I haven't heard about, about any whales in the younger era, but I don't know, maybe once I heard that somebody found a whale in the desert, maybe you could try there. A whale in the desert. Okay, interesting. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Let go again. Hello, stranger. Welcome to the desert. Thank you. Call me Ishmael, and I am looking for Moby Dick. Moby what? Moby Dick? Moby Dick. What is that? It's a whale. But no, it's, it's an exceptionally large spam whale. Well, anyway. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we're in the middle of the desert. I, I don't think there are very many whales here. Well, that makes sense. 
However, have you heard of um, Allah, Muhammad, Islam? A little bit. Okay, well, let me tell you something. I am a scholar of Islam, and I've been um, copying the holy texts of the Quran, which is our holy book of Islam, and it tells about salvation. It's about 114 chapters, many pages. It would take me hours and hours to read, and I'm still copying it, so I don't know the whole part. But I can tell you what I do know. The Quran tells many stories, stories that might be found in the Bible, but also talks about um, things that God told Muhammad, things about morality, things about religion, things about the Hajj, things about the pillars of Islam, very many things, very beautiful. However, I can see that, you know, you don't have too much time. So I'll just try to condense it for you. Basically, the Quran, it's about Allah as our supreme master. And we ourselves are slaves to Allah. And we must accept guidance from the all-knowing, all-powerful Allah as a slave would accept the instructions from his master. And let me tell you something very important. It's called the Shema. Ashhadu an la ila ila Allah. Wa ashadu ana Muhammadan rasulu Allah. I can see you're a little bit confused. I'll, I'll try to translate it into English. It goes something like this. There is no God but God, except in our language, God is Allah. So there is no Allah but Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet. So there you go. That is the essence of the Quran, the essence of Islam. So I hope that you can submit yourself to Allah and be able to accept his guidance as a slave would accept his master's will. So, Allah is Allah. And Muhammad the prophet. Exactly. Very good, my friend. Now, you're looking for a whale, right? Yes. Well, I heard that there might be a whale in some far-off land called Lebanon. Maybe, Le you, maybe you might want to try there. Lebanon. Yes, Lebanon. Interesting stuff. Well, thank you very much. Farewell, my friend, and Allah be with you. You too. Let's go. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Lebanon. Who are you? No. Who are you? No, I asked first. Who are you? No, 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 no. no. I'm the visitor. Who, Who are you? Who are you? Okay. Call me Ishmael. And I am Khalil Gibran. Khalil Gibran? Yes. Interesting. Yes. So, let me tell you a bit about myself and then you can tell me about whatever you're looking for. I was born here in Lebanon, as you can see. Very beautiful, a lot of sand, and it's just very beautiful. I lived here for 12 years, but when I was 12 years old, my mother took my siblings and myself to Boston. Sound familiar? I lived there. Oh, nice. So, during that time, I was in this school with a lot of immigrants, a lot of Chinese, and I knew nothing, like no Chinese at all. So I couldn't communicate with them. But I really had, I had this passion for art. And Mary Haskell, she became my benefactor and she still is my benefactor. She made it possible for me to go to Paris and study art. I, myself, went through a lot in my own precious life. Beautiful life and amazing life. Therefore, I dedicated myself to literature because I had a lot to say about beauty, love, passion, death, whatever you want to put in those topics. And that made me the key figure of the romantic movement in the Arabic literature. And just to show you how good of an artist I am, I made this. It's my own vision of God. But... That's my art piece. Now let me present to you a bit of my literature work, my creation, the prophet, 
You can ask him anything you want. Anything. Ask him. Go ahead. Him? Yes, him. The prophet. Hello. Hi. Can I ask you whatever I want? You can ask anything you want. Well, tell me about pain. You okay? Listen up. Your pain is the breaking of the shell that enclosed your understanding. Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that his heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you will accept the seasons of your heart, as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you will watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter poison by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust in the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the unseen, by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup that he brings, though it burns your lips, has been fashioned by the clay of which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. Amazing, right? Man, that was deep. Mm -hmm. But still, you haven't answered my question. Well, you didn't ask a question. But well, no. I <laughs> good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for Moby Dick. Moby what? Moby Dick. It's a whale. Oh. An exceptionally large sperm whale with a wrinkled brow, crooked jaw, and especially bushy spout. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about whales, and my prophet doesn't either. So, you should probably go to Arabia. Yes, Arabia. Arabia. Yes, they're crazy people. You can find a lot of wisdom there. Okay. Thank you. And farewell. Hello. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Amazing. Welcome to Persia. What are you doing here? Well, I'm looking for Moby Dick. Moby Dick? Yes. The whale? Yes. What are you doing in the desert? Anyway, you're here just in time. 1001 Nights, also known as the Arabian Nights, tells the story of King Shariar, who discovers his wife's infidelity and decides to do something about it. He becomes embittered to all the women in all the land. To avenge his betrayal, every night he marries a new virgin, only for the next morning to have her executed. Shahrazad, the vizier's daughter, volunteers to marry the king, thus hoping to end his tyranny. Tonight, right now, She's beginning her first captivating tale, which always ends in a cliffhanger, thereby postponing her execution. Let's have a listen. It has been related to me, O oh happy king, that there was a certain merchant who had great wealth and traded extensively with surrounding countries. And one day, he mounted his horse and journeyed to a neighboring country to collect what was due to him. And with the heat oppressing him, he sat under a tree in a garden. And he put his hand into his saddlebag. And he ate a morsel of bread and a date 
which were among his provisions. Having eaten the date, he threw aside the stone, and immediately there appeared before him a genie of enormous height, who holding a drawn sword in his hand, approached him and said, Rise, that I may kill thee, as thou hast killed my son. The merchant asked him, How have I killed thy son? He answered, When thou ate the date and threw aside the stone, it hit my son upon the chest. And as fate had decreed against him, he died instantly. And you shall hear many more, much more about this story, my happy king, if I am alive tomorrow to relate it to you. Amazing. Shahrazad goes on to tell for 1,001 more nights, more tales of magic, love, adventure, and intrigue, softening the king's heart and ultimately saving her life. So you don't need Moby Dick anymore. You can just stay here with us. What do you say? Well, I have to admit, that story was amazing. But I need to fulfill my task. I understand, my friend. Well, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Hey, hey, a question. Do you know where can I go? You might want to try China. I heard Moby Dick swam there. China? Yes. Interesting. See. Hello. Hi there. How are you? And this is how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> so Where am I? <laughs> you are in China, and I'm a missionary. Actually, I'm Father Mateo Rixi, and these are Chinese people, as you can tell. I'm teaching them English, and some of Italian as well. They might go to Rome soon, you know what I mean? No. <laughs> well, anyways, so uh, what are you here for? I'm looking for a whale. I'm looking for Moby Dick. You know what it is? I don't know what you're talking about, but I can tell you a story. A go very ahead. interesting legend that I found here in this land, here in China. The legend of Mulan. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So, Mulan is a girl whose father is very old to go to war against nomadic hordes. So she takes his place and she goes dressing as a man. Surprisingly, she succeeds and she suffered a position in the high office but she decides to go back to her hometown. Over there, she dresses herself as she used to. And her comrades realize that she's actually a woman. Can you believe that? What an exploit. So here is a, a passage of the Ballad of Mulan of the 400s. <clears throat> My father has no grown-up son, and I have no elder brother. I'm willing to buy a horse and saddle to go to battle in my father's place. Here, we can find seeds of the word. Truth, goodness, and beauty can be found in Chinese culture, and we can proceed to an inculturation, which is what I'm trying to do. Good. Well, if you are still looking for great stories, I have a great story to tell. 
is the romance of the three kingdoms. The romance of the three kingdoms was written in the... Uh, <laughs> how rude this was to me. The romance of the three kingdoms was written in the 14th century in the Ming dynasty of event that happened 1,000 years before. It tells us the story of the dissolution of the Han dynasty in 184 AD and the following struggles of warlords for power and the reestablishment of the reunified monarchy in 280 AD by the Qin dynasty. The Qin dynasty was the one who actually gave the name to the country, China, China. This book is, well, is written as a novel, but is based on the records of the time, so historically speaking, is very accurate. Chinese consider this book their masterpiece. Reflecti reflecting on their own literature, Chinese see this book as a critique on Confucianism, especially when contrasting with the reality of human ambition and empty legalism. Hello. Hello. You are in a journey, right? Yes, I am. Each one of you is also in a journey. I will speak to you about the great 16th century Chinese novel, Journey to the West. He tells the story of a Buddhist monk and his journey to India, to the West, in search for the sacred Buddhist scriptures. Let me share with you how his quest started. It might help you in your own personal journey. The emperor was gathered with his people and he addressed them saying, who is willing to accept our commission to seek scriptures from Buddha in the Western heaven? Hardly had he finished speaking when the master of the law stepped from the side and said, though your poor monk has no talent, I am willing to seek these scriptures from the Western heaven on behalf of your majesty that the empire of our king may be firm and everlasting. Highly pleased, the emperor replied, if you're willing to accept, if you're willing to express your loyalty in this way, undaunted by the great distance and by the journey over mountains and streams, we are willing to become bond brothers with you. Deeply moved, the monk replied, I shall not spare myself in this journey, but I shall proceed with all diligence until I reach the Western heaven. If I do not attain my goal or the true scriptures, I shall not return to our land, even if I have to die. I would rather die and fall into eternal perdition in hell than to return here without the true scriptures. Sheshe. That was good. But you haven't answered my question. Do you know where can I find the whale, Moby Dick? I think we can, you can find further enlightenment in the land of the rising sun. That's Japan, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Sheshe. Sheshe. Let's go. Hello there. Hello. Who are you? Call me Ishmael. Hello, Ishmael. I'm Omar San. And I'm Angel San. And you are in Japan. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Moby Dick. Are you looking for Moby Dick? Moby Dick. You are crazy. What is, what is Moby Dick? Oh. It's an exceptionally large uh, sperm whale. 
Sorry, but uh, we don't know anything about Moby Sun. Oh. Moby Dick. Mo Moby Dick. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know anything about it. But wait a minute. We know about Genji. The tale of Genji is one of the most important stories in the foundation of our identity that has influenced many Western cultures and still does it. Actually, do you know what the difference is between a Chinese and a Japanese? I think I know that. Um, maybe it's that the Chinese don't know the tale of Genji. The tale of Genji was one of the first novels ever written in human history. It was written by Murasaki Shikibu in the year 1000 AD. And it tells the life of Prince Genji and his royal, familiar, romantic, and existential experiences during his life. That work shows all the vices and problems of man and society. But it also highlights all the virtues and values of our culture at that time. In the story, Genji is a materialistic man attached to the worldly pleasures. But after the death of his mother, he constantly seeks to recover the love that he lacked from her and finds it in Murasaki. It is in her that he will learn how to love in a pure way. But unfortunately, when Murasaki dies, he's just gonna realize that all the pain and suffering that he caused her. And then he will enter in a spiritual battle that leads him to correct his actions. This sounds very interesting, but you may be wondering why this story is so important for us. And the truth is that it is not only important, but, but essential. essential. This work lays the foundation of our culture. It was written in the Heian period that lasted from the 8th to the 12th century AD and marks the consolidation of Japanese writing and a cultural and literary independence from Chinese influence. In the Heian period, which means period of peace, it coincides with the writing of medieval epics like El Cantar del Mio Cid. It also coincides with the Carolinian Renaissance, which was a cultural revival driven by the Emperor Charlemagne and also with the development of Romanesque architecture. And also this work is really important for us because it was one of the first novels written with the original Japanese alphabet. And it, in, it also shows us what the culture of both people and royalty was like, was like at that time. That work was for us one of the first works that presented how was the, the, our values, how was the perfect man, and how our culture should be. It also lays in the foundation of our Japanese nationalism, which will emerge after World War II, that will later generate the globally well-known manga, our last literary form, that has influenced many Western authors like Jorge Luis Borges and Virginia Woolf. Thank you. That was good, but still, I'm looking for the whale and you didn't tell me where it is. Have you tried even in the ocean? <laughs> este, no. Okay, well, so, yeah, I mean, well, I recommend you, you, ca you can sail the Pacific, you can look there, and then you will arrive to a new land that is called the Americas, and you can ask them. The Americas. Yes. It's gonna be a long trip. Arigato. Arigato. I'm tired. Hello, welcome to the Americas. Hello. We are missionaries working with indigenous peoples in these new lands. You are missionaries? Yes, we are missionaries. In I love my you. case, yes. Well, you will see. In my case, I have been working with the Mayas from Yucatan to Honduras and the Incas in Peru. All these cultures had a really important literary production, even before the Spaniards arrived. With the Mayas, we have two main works, Chilambalam and Popol Vuh. These works were translated into Spanish by the missionaries. There you can find stories about the origins of the world, 
the civilization, stories about heroes, and the importance of the underworld, Chivalba. Also, you can find many elements that are similar to Christian beliefs, or even explicitly Christians. This is a good element because it allows us to understand better the syncretism that is part of our indigenous and Latin American culture. Also, if you go to Peru in the south, you will find that the Incas wrote a lot of different, different literary production. The problem was that everything was oral. So with the help of some missionaries who learned Quechua, all of these things were translated and also written. You have the manuscripts of Huarochiri and the tales and myths of the Incas. There you find the origins of the Inca civilization. And there are also some plays, really important dramas. The tragedy of Ollantay, a poor soldier who falls in love with the daughter of the Inca, and the tragedy of the end of Atahualpa, the last Inca emperor. Friar Ernesto can tell you more things about other important cultures, like the Aztecs. Hello. Y yes, uh, how can I help you? Well, go ahead, tell your story. Oh, I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm too busy. I'm trying to preserve these guys' cultures. Uh, I've been entrusted with, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. So I've been entrusted with the care of many indigenous. You can see them right here. Some of them are very smart. They're hardworking. They're good people. And as, as Fray Sebastian said, there was a highly developed culture even before the Spaniards arrived. For me, it's very important to understand. And as he said, they not only have epic poems or tragedies, they also have poetry. And from the poetry, the biggest exponent is a warrior king from the 1200s, Nezahualcoyotl. Nezahualcoyotl has a really famous poem called The Sing of the Sensontle, which is an endemic Mexican bird. I invite you to find that bird instead of finding a whale. More beautiful. Anyways, some misguided opinions would say, further in time, that John Keats is the purest of the romantics. I don't agree. And maybe it's because he never got to know Nezahualcoyotl. But in my opinion, Nezahualcoyotl and the topics of his poetry, death, nature, transcendence, and also the love for life itself, it's even more romantic. Plus, he didn't have any need to portray or to give any political message. He was already king of everything, military king. So in that regard, maybe you can leave me, uh, continue my work, and you can go down to South America in the Portuguese domain. They might tell you some interesting stories too. Down there, what do you mean? Hola, yeah. hola, oi, tudo bem? Tudo bem, e você? Oh, sorry, sorry. I am José de Anchieta, the missionary of Brazil, a son of Ignatius. And this is Itaim Carijoao, my native fellow. How? Pay attention, he doesn't speak that much of this language, modern languages. Because I, instead of teaching them Portuguese, I got their own language, and I taught them their own language. I created their grammar. So if you want to listen to a poem in Tupi that has more than 120 dialects, you can listen to one of them right now with a simultaneous translation. Huh? What about? Sounds good. Tata Rovere. The spark of the fire. Mita Manduape left his trace. Astre Istredire in the child's memory. Tata Rendage in the mark of the fire. Ojo Chiechive follow me through life. Ohei e Einia what can to be erased. Tata Ravasa blessing of the fire. O happy vacue, then burned. O in my word. Interesting. Very nice. 
very good. Like fire. But Tata. Tata. But what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for a whale. It's called Moby Dick. That's a di difficult question. My, can I ask him? No, no, no. He doesn't speak your language. Wait, wait. And he might give you three, three answers. Yoka kachapa. Kunawaro mapurite. Chihuara mukumbari. Wait, wait, I can translate. So, he has three different words at least for a whale. Can be a whale that existed before, a whale that is existing right now, and a whale that might come in the future. So it's pretty hard to tell you which one you're looking for. But, but as we are all missionaries, and this uh, new baptized Christian, please. So, we all can give you a blessing in your trip to the north, okay? Back home is what you say? Yeah. Ite in pace. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you. Well, I guess I gotta go again. I don't know what happened, but it was amazing. Something has changed in me. I feel different. My heart has changed. Because before I look at the world through the lens of revenge, but now I know that the human heart is richer than we think it is. And so is mine. It is incredible when you let yourself feel sadness and joy, anger and peace, dryness and passion. Or when you pray and act, when you experience and reflect, and when you go out Look at the world and then come back to yourself to meditate and mature. I was a fool, just like Ahab, when I thought everything was at hand. I knew everything. Oh man, that was the biggest mistake I could have made. How many beautiful things I missed only because I was focused on a simple whale. The biggest mistake that a man can make is to think that he knows everything, that he has seen everything and nothing is able to impress him. Then he is going blind, just as I did, just as Ahab did. Before my home was my whale. Now I have the whole world. My family were, were my harpoons. Now it's all mankind. My goal was to kill a whale. Now is to gain life and share it with others. If man stops to contemplate the beauty of creation instead of complaining about it, he would realize how wonderful it is. He would be filled with happiness instead of jealously. His words would, would be words of trust and love instead of lies and war. For this reason, young man, learn the lesson and bring this experience into your heart. You don't need to travel on time again. Go and read a book. But not only read it, enjoy it. If you can meet people, go ahead, do it. But listen to them. Try to understand them. There is always something new to learn. Let yourself be surprised 
Do not lose your shot. If you are studying the human heart, open your heart first. And then you will see how you will bring many beautiful treasures to your heart. How you will become a better man. Thank you very much. Now, I invite some friends to share with us. His musical talents. To Japan, where the curses grow, Yoshimono's home, I dare not go, for if I do, as you will say, did you ever see a gawa riding a manga down in Japan, down to Peru, where the Andes rise, over Machu Picchu, where the condors fly, if I wander too far, as the Wapa will say, did you ever hear a gamma say no problema down in Peru, down to Mozambique, where the falls grow tall, to the land of Maconde, where the story's central, if I wander astray, the spirits may say. Did you ever hear a hippo standing on his tiptoe? Down in Mozambique, down to Norway, where the fjords extend, to the land of Vikings, where legends blend, if I say too far, great or may say. Have you ever seen trolls popping out of holes down in Norway, down to Arabia, where the sun stretches wide, to the land of Aladdin, where dreams abide? If I venture too far, the genie may say. Have you ever seen the camels very into like animals? And miss the sandy sprays unto the chat Where the tales are full To the lands of trap Where tales are told If I wander too far Then mummies may say Have you ever seen an elephant Being benevolent down in Chad Down to China Where the great walls told To the land of pandas where legends and thrones, if I stray too far, our mother may say. Did you ever see a dragon drinking from a flagon? Down, down, down in the region, brace down to Australia, in the old black past, to the big green forest, where koalas last. And if I get lost, then I think I may say. Did you ever see a teacher dancing with a kangaroo along the way down to Indonesia, where the islands wide, to the land of temples, where spirits abide? If I wander too deep, the heaven may say. Did you ever see a Komodo dragon fighting the, the orangutan? Down in Indonesia's bay, down to Brazil, where the Amazon spreads. To the land of Samba, where we the strength. If I venture too far, the trippy may say. Oka, manduake, me, mambuape. Down in Brazil. <laughs> 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 
Now we would like to invite Father Miguel de la Torre to give final words. Well, one of the, um, fav my favorite books is by a monk, Jean Leclerc, who died in 1993. He came to the US. He also had some conferences with another famous monk, Thomas Merton. And some of his conferences were written, were made a book. And the French title he gave it is, Love as Seen by the Monks. In English, the title is, the love for learning and the desire for God. And in another language, like Portuguese, which is the one that I read, it's amor pelas letras, yo desejo de Deus. And it is very interesting how he actually wrote it about love, and most of the translations are about words and letters and literature. And in those conferences, he claims that the monk's mission, the more he loves God through literature, through sacred scripture, through culture, the more he ends up loving every human being and actually opening himself to the whole world. And I was actually a little bit emotional in the back for all of you, but especially those of you who were novices here. Four years ago, we were just in the other classroom studying sacred scripture and getting into writing and words and the meaning of each book of Revelation and how God speaks and how we learn to love God through literature. And then today, four years later, before you go to Rome and study about Father Matteo Ricci, here you are speaking about the world literature. We began with the Middle East, sacred scripture. And then during these two years of humanities, you came to the West, you went a little bit deeper into Western culture, and now towards the end of your humanities, all of you, all of you went Far East in most uh, classes and in a very special way in literature and in a very, very special way through this academy. So that vocation of religious life in the church is very well manifested by all of you. The more we get into sacred scripture, which is Middle Eastern literature, the more we get to love God. And the more we study the Bible and love God, the more we learn to understand the heart of the human person, love the human person, and open our hearts to the whole world, to wherever God may send you. So congratulations to, for this beautiful academy. I think all of us were definitely surprised. And Two years ago when you arrived, I received many complaints about you. You might know that by now, right? From the other brothers. They used to come to me, Father, you are in charge of studies. Please talk to the first year brothers, not to study so much. Please tell them to come to the Christmas room. Tell them to come to recreation. Tell them not to spend so much time studying. And I asked those brothers who came to me, well, are the brothers studying at the proper times, or they're just studying out of place? No, Father, they're actually studying at the proper times. But that's too much. Like They should be more with us doing other things. <laughs> that was the greatest complaint that I received about all of you, my brothers. So it was worth it. I think through your study and through your prayer, in these two years, in these four years, all of you, and those of you who were here in this novitiate, through that love for study, love for writing, love for learning, and love for God, you have shown what it means to be a religious. So keep doing it. Uh, in a few months, you will go to Rome and start studying philosophy. You've read all these books. You've tried to find the heart of man in all these books. Now, when you go to Rome, you will actually try to understand the mind behind the human heart. And they work together, the mind and the heart. So the more you read, the more you will actually understand philosophy afterwards. What makes a man a man? And the more you do that, the greater the desire for God will be. So congratulations. Thank you to you and thank you to 
Dr. López.